Welcome to Electrify, the video show and podcast for electricians only, with your hosts, Paul Abernathy and Jay, the Basement King Grunberg. Sit back and enjoy the show. What up, what up, everybody? Welcome to a special edition of Electrify. This is the Residential Wiring Series. My name is Paul Abernathy, and I'm going to be your tour guide for today's journey into part five of a multi-part series on residential wiring. We have selected our electrician of choice for these video series, and we are giving commentary uh, today, I do not have my partner in crime with me, Mr. Grunberg, the Basement King, but I promise you he will be back for episode six as usual. Uh, but you've got me as your tour guide today, and we're going to be looking at the home run segment uh, of this series. So to kind of catch you up to where we are, if you haven't watched part one, part two, part three, and part four, do me a favor. Go back and watch them. They are really, really good episodes and we start working our way through the planning and the layout. And then we work our way through boxes for receptacles and switch boxes, what he calls low boxes. And then we move into the high boxes uh, and, you know, uh, ceiling outlets and things like that. And then we, and we give our commentary. And then he moves on to installing a panel cabinet in his garage. And he gives some insight on that. Uh, and some really good information. Uh, Jay was with me on that one, and Jay gave me some gave me some insight into kind of jaw ache right here. Uh, insight into uh, our panel installs and things like that. So now we're going to be pushing into the home runs, and we're going to see what our electrician has. And uh, I think I cracked my jaw. Anyway. We're going to be looking at some insights there, and I'll give you my feedback and commentary where necessary for that. Got the headphones uh, ready to go so we can listen to what our electrician has to say, uh, and we'll just kind of get into it. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we'll do my best to try to answer them as we go into this electrician's presentation, and let's see what he's got going on. So without further ado, let's go on and uh, jump into it. Also, a shout out to those that are in the chat room, uh, Joseph, Demetrio, Ronald, thank you for joining, Abraham, all of y'all, thanks for joining us on the stream, appreciate you being here. Uh, kind of was a last minute thing, that's the reason the Basement King can't be with me, because I kind of sprung this on him very quickly. So, uh, y'all know me, I get spontaneous, and I just want to do a live and do some education, and we have a lot of these video series to go. So this is just part five. We're going to have dozens of these in different topics that we critique and give our insight so that you can learn from either other people's mistakes or we can enhance it and add additional information so that you can put a visual to something. And then maybe we can give you some advice on how you would might do this differently. Things like that. Okay. All right. So let's go on and get into this lesson with our electrician. Okay. So we're familiar with our electrician. Uh, Demetrio, thank you for the, uh, the nice comments. Um, I try to give back as, as much as I can and help the industry every way I can. So, um, again, for those that are in our fast tracks program or our training programs, uh, it helps fund all these things that I do. So trust me, we, we try to give it back and we do appreciate everything that y'all do and, and the contributions and how y'all stay engaged in this. Again, y'all are all part of this too. Okay, it's not just us doing this. So, all right, so let's get the headphones on. And we're good to go. And I will get with our electrician and we will start the critiquing and advice. And uh, maybe we'll just be tickled to death with it or maybe not. We'll see. We'll see what's, what's, uh, what's going to go on. I'm starting this video with the end of the episode. And I just want to show you what we're going to be doing today. And these are all the home runs that go to the house. And hopefully when you watch this video, you can get an idea from what, what we do to get the home runs to the destinations they need to be in. I'm not the best at making these videos. I just really want to show you guys what we do day in, day out, out here in the field. 
and a lot of people make these videos and they don't show you shit they don't want to tell you nothing they just want to talk about the work that they just finished but i really want to give people an idea of what they're getting into if they're thinking about being an electrician this is just residential work we do this every day and if you're really looking into to doing this type of stuff like this is the real shit like it's hard labor but it pays so well it pays really good and once you learn to trade and you get into it and you and you decide that you like it or whatever you can make a killing but it's all right just so just to chime in um again uh electrical trade is a wonderful trade uh, i have been in it over 30 years of course, if you listen to other people, they'll say, well, Paul, the reason you teach is because you can't do it anymore. <laughs> the reality is, how long do I have to do something? Uh, I'm a code guy. I have moved into that realm. I like to teach other people. Uh, but I have pulled every cable that you've seen here. I've installed panels. I've done all this. Just like this gentleman, you're doing it too. And the sky's the limit. Depending on where you're at in the country, what your pay scale is, again, you can be your own boss. You can work for somebody if you're content with that. If you want to own your own company someday, that's the beautiful thing about being an electrician is that you can go in any direction you want, right? And if you want to do service work, you can do service work. If you want to do landscaping aspects of, of electrical, go for it. If you want to do um, just residential only, um, maybe you just want to do, maybe you want to be a specialist like Jay. So Jay is the basement king, right? And that's his specialty. I would put him up against anybody in the country when it comes to doing basements, okay? And you're thinking, what's the difference? Well, the nuances to basements, and hopefully you'll get a taste of that as we put together the, the podcast called Kicking It With The King, which is a podcast that he'll be producing. It kind of gives you some insight into being a business owner, understanding the nuances of running a business to determine whether or not that is something you want to do. So again, he'll be putting that together. Hopefully sometime soon we'll have something. It's called Kicking It With The King. And it'll be some insight into day-to-day uh, uh, -day operations and business as a, a growing electrical contractor. Now, he focuses on basements. By no means does that mean that's all he can do. That is just his niche. And he's done very well with it. And he's growing very well with it. That and panel changes and all that. So um, again, there's so many things that you can do as an electrician. So once you get into it, don't think that everything on every day is doing the same cookie cutter thing. Uh-uh. Sky's the limit on how you want to take it, where you want to specialize. Maybe you want to do generators. Maybe you just want to do service work. Maybe you want to do residential work. Maybe you want to be a commercial guy. Okay. Um, maybe you want to go union. Maybe you want to go non-union. The sky's the limit. The stiff, the, your, your imagination can go anywhere you want once you have that card, once you become a license, once you've earned it then you can take it with you and do what you need to do. So just kind of wanted to put that insight because he's absolutely right, okay? So now, are you going to be Warren Buffett rich? No. Are you going to be comfortable and you're going to be proud of what you do and you're going to get a good night's sleep? You're going to be able to provide for your family? Absolutely. Absolutely, you're going to be able to do that, okay? All right. Uh, and, uh, Joseph says, on the East Coast, lots of basements got flooded about three feet deep with water and gunk. Hey, my thing about that is that means they clean it all out. Everybody still wants to use those basements. Now I get to wire them bad boys again, gut all that wiring that is exposed, reinstall it, make me some money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay. Again, you know what? Funny thing about construction is in disaster, in flooding, and you know, the sad part about these tornadoes that hit through Kentucky area and all those areas is that it's huge loss of life, devastation, it's heartbreaking. But if you have to look at it from a construction perspective, it causes people to get out and, and, and start rebuilding again. And, 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 you know, the trades are necessary and we need that skilled labor to get us back so we can get these homes back for these people, get their lives back in order. And that's what the trades do, right? We come in, and we try to get people to some sort of back to normalcy again. And that's the beautiful thing about our trade as well. So uh, we need the tradesmen. We need to stop forcing kids to college and think about the fact that they can pursue a career in the vocational field and make darn good money at it. Darn good money at it. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking that we need to get people back on that track. 
Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Kind of went on my little tangent and let's get back and let him do his thing. I'm glad he edited that last part out there. Yeah. Put up the panel. We've already gone through laying out the house, low boxing, high boxing, and putting up the panel. And in this one, I want to show you the home run. Finally, running the wire. Cable. It's probably 80% yeah. of our job is putting this wire where it needs to go. And it's probably the most time consuming. But after I get the panel up, I kind of like to run all the home runs, and then once I'm done with that, then we can start getting the completing circuits. So anyways. So just an insight to him. So this is by no means, let me, let me make this clear. This does not mean that this is a, a, our recommended way of doing this. For example, I do it totally opposite from him. Um, I don't run the home runs first. I, you know what? I like to lay out my rooms, lay out my circuits, and identify where my home runs need to go so that I know, you know, what receptacles, uh, what lighting circuits are all going to be on each run. And then I identify which receptacle or which switch location is going to be my home run. And then I mark it. And that's where I take my home runs last. So he does his first. I like to do mine last because personally, I like to get an idea when I'm pulling the cables and, and doing the different rooms and what's going to be on the circuit. I like to get an idea of how I'm laying out my circuit and how many things that are going to be on it before I run that home run. Cause there's a lot of misconceptions in residential. Uh, you're going to hear people say that this jurisdiction only allows me 10 receptacles uh, on a, on a 15 amp circuit and a 12 on a 20 uh, reality is that is n there, residential. It doesn't have a limitation. Right, So I could have 50 receptacles on a single circuit. Now, you are limited to the rooms like brand circuits, small appliance, minimum of two in a kitchen, and things like that. But in reality, um, the three VA per square foot for a dwelling that we do in a calculation uh, in 220.14 is basically going to cover all those general use receptacles and general use lighting so at the three VA. But it doesn't tell you the maximum number of receptacles, for example, you can have on a brand circuit. Now, if you're a commercial guy, you're thinking, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. It's 180 VA per uh, strap. I get you, but this isn't commercial. This is residential. So you can use a standard baseline and figure 120 volts, 15 amp circuit, come up with what your wattage or, or VA is and, and, and do it by 15 amp circuit and to determine how many receptacles theoretically you should have. But as far as NEC goes, they really don't. So we use something called rule of thumb. And every bird is different, uh, but I've heard people say that I'll put up to 12 uh, luminaires uh, or receptacles, not 12 of both, on one 15-amp circuit. Uh, I've heard different things. Um, again, important when you lay out your circuit. Um, it's been common for me to do two bedrooms on one circuit, right? So you could have as many as uh, five receptacles in this one, five receptacles in that one, and a light in each bedroom, and that would be one brand circuit. You can say that's, I would never do that. You'd put less than that. That's totally up to you because the NEC does not tell you, okay? Now, you can say, well, I use good common practices and whatnot. Hey, you do what you do you, right? But the NEC is not going to tell us when it comes to residential. Now, you have to keep the circuits balanced, keep everything balanced as you put it. You use a little common sense. You wouldn't put 30 receptacles on a single 15 amp brand circuit uh, it, that probably wouldn't be what you do, but the code doesn't prohibit it, right? Because you're still going to be putting that, let's say, on a 15 amp brand circuit. So it doesn't matter how many receptors you have, you're still going to be limiting your load to 15 amps, right? So at the end of the day, just use a little common sense. I tell people anywhere between, you know, 10 to 12 on a 15 amp, uh, 12 to 14 on a 20 amp. Uh, and again, I treat receptacles, and for the most part, because of the lighting today, uh, I treat all of them as an item. So 12 overall items, 10 overall items, 14 overall items, depending on whether you're using a 15 or 20 amp circuit, is probably going to be pretty safe for you. 
Now, the only problem that would ever become a serious issue is in a lot of larger homes where there's a lot of lighting and you're going to be putting this lighting. You need to know what the wattage is because, again, that is something that is static, right? That is not that's variable like a receptacle. That lighting load is a given. So depending on the wattage is, that's the wattage. So you have to be careful how many you put on a brand circuit. But other than that, that is really your only limitation when it comes to that, when we're talking about general lighting and general use receptacles and that type of thing. Okay. So just some insight to think about. You'll hear rumors from people. You'll hear people make things up. You'll say this is good practice. But again, that their opinion is what it is. Okay. You don't use 180 VA on a residential. Okay. But you can use it as a baseline if you want to use it as a baseline to kind of keep you in between the lines, if you will. But again, just wanted to throw that out there so you're aware of it. I'm going to start with the 12 wire. And um, I like to put the wire right next to the panel. This is why I do this. Okay, so he's got, he's using a lazy Susan. Uh, some people use real holders. I used to have the ones that actually would mount a hook onto the stud. He would have a hard time doing it here because of the way it is. Uh, but he's using a lazy Susan that's going to pull it out. The wires, the, the cable is going to come out pretty straight, not kind of curly cued and whatnot like that. So again, I like his little uh, lazy Susan. You can make these. You can actually buy, uh, get cut pieces of plywood and cut two pieces in the middle of it. You can buy the little lazy Susans and you connect it to both sides of the plywood and you can create a spinner. Uh, you can create it. You can, obviously, you can buy these as well. There's some devices that are available. But again, I like it, uh, what he's using with it. First, I like to clear out the garage. And I like to use this space just to lay out the wire so I can run in a lot. Pulling your wire out like this is the key to keeping it looking good. I agree with that. Which, 100%. It doesn't really matter. But I've been doing this for a long time, and I like my wires to look straight as possible in the attic. I'm not going to start in a hole because, especially with these runs being so long, they're probably going to get kinked up or thing, whatever, and you have to keep them coming back. So we're just going to start in this bay. Makes sense. That's what I would do. Now, only comment that I'll add here is, you know, again, he's an electrician. You can, you, he's pulling them at the end. I mean, at the very beginning rather than at the end. So me, when I'm putting in the, the, the branch circuits and I'm laying out the rooms and I'm drilling the holes and I'm pulling the, the cables and everything and we're cutting it in and I'm marking where the home runs are, then I have better understanding of where I want to go. So in his, you know, part one, part two, part three, part four, he really didn't give any notice or say any statement of where his home runs are going because then you just got random boxes everywhere. So it can get confusing what you're going to be looping together and what's going to be on this circuit or that circuit. So that is why I like to lay out my circuits, run my cables around the boxes and cut everything in. And it, well, if, even if I don't cut it in, I like to run everything, tuck it in a box, and then I pull my home runs at the end, that type of thing, because then I have more of a direction where I'm going to go. Uh, it also allows me to determine whether or not I can set up double reels and save a little time. Instead of pulling one cable like that, I might be able to pull, if it's a kitchen, I might be able to pull two 12 twos at the same time since he seems like it's just going right over those trusses. Uh, again, time management, it doesn't matter if you pull one at a time, uh, as he's doing. Uh, but if I know where my boxes are and I know where I'm going to go, uh, then again, it's all, you know, I can be a little more efficient when I did my pull. Uh, that's just me. Everybody's can be a little different. Going out of this wall, I want to go ahead and pull out some of them. And I have another ladder on the other side of the wall, so. Obviously, we're being careful uh, how we're routing these cables. Uh, looking out for scuttle holes, looking out for things like that, uh, looking out where I might be within a certain distance, whether it's six feet or seven feet from the scuttle hole, depending again on whether or not I have a pull down access or just, just a simple scuttle hole, it's going to make a difference. And so I'm thinking about 
all those things when I'm pulling those home runs uh, and uh, keeping that in mind. And I'm sure he is doing it as well. First location I show you to is going to be a kitchen GFI. Most kitchens have two of them. So like I said, it's a kitchen GFI, so we have to mark the line side. So you can just put a little mark on it or you can crimp it with your fines. So yeah, when he talks about the crimp method, a lot of times what we do is on all of our feeds, our home runs, uh, line side applications, like what he's talking about for receptacle, because he needs to know line and load for where he's going to put his GFCI receptacle, is we'll just take our side cutters and crimp, 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 and put some notches on it. That reminds us that it is the line. Uh, and other times, if it's a traveler, we'll, we'll cut an angle at the end or cut a kind of point on it to let you know something's a traveler or something like that. So you get used to these different marks that you'll make on it. Uh, some people just simply just grab a Sharpie and write on it, and that's fine as well. It's all good until you, you know, go to strip it off. Just make sure you keep that in mind if you're going to strip it. Um, but other than that, I mean, he's marking his line side for his uh, uh, GFCI. Now, for me, if that is the kitchen, I would have pulled at the same time another 12, and it would save me, save me a little time uh, because I'm gonna, probably going to go that same route. But again, again, everybody's different and can do it that way. Now let's see here. We got a commercial coming up here, so. So now we can go back to the pan. Okay, got to pay the bills. There you go. And we'll just guess how much we need. Absolutely, Nick. I I I used to pull, do large homes too, and man, I pulled as many as I could, and but I knew where my home runs are. You know, so I was pulling that way, so. We'll pull it tight. I wouldn't and pull it too we'll tight. Need is the wire to go to the bottom of the panel. Okay, so this is this is an example. Um, of course, he's pulling it. He's cutting it from the reel. So um, I never did it this way. I didn't pull mine in like this. I actually pulled all of mine here, and then I would you know, hold it down, mark where it needs to be. And then I would strip my sheathing off and do everything. And then I would put it in so that when I was putting it in all of the, the grounded and the ungrounded and the equipment grounds were already stripped out as I was putting in it. So when I'm pulling my home runs, I don't take them into the panel. So, um, because either way, I still got to strip them. I preferred to strip them outside and then put them in, but to each his own. But he's right. I usually would, would let it run down, and I would just go just about to the bottom or just a little bit below the panel, and I knew at that point I had enough to work with. Again, everybody has their own style, so this is just what he does, so it's all good. But don't forget to mark your wires. Kitchen, GFI, one. So again, we're going to go pull some slack off. Yeah, uh, not R. Kelly. I'm telling you, uh, once I started using the spinners years ago, and these were the spinners that actually hooked onto the stud, so it had a hook that hooked the back of the stud, and it was a metal spinner, looked like a, a record player. It made all the difference in the, more, in the world. I could throw my reel of 14.2 or 12.2 on there, and it just would come off, and it just made it so much easier. Pulling it through studs had less issues of ripping the sheathing, pulling it, it just, it fed off so much easier. And now today they have so many different devices that can do this, uh, whether it's the Lazy Susan or they even have some that the reels go in upright. Um, you know, he's buying the wire in this, these bigger reels, like these look like 2,500 foot reels um, or th even a thousand foot reels. He could actually set them up on, you know, and pull it like a normal payoff that you would get for a normal big reel. And, and set it up like that way as well. He could rig up something um, and do that, kind of like a sawhorse deal or something where he actually put his piece of EMT across it and put his reel on it and then drove some nails over the EMT to hold it in place. And he could roll them off. And then he could actually put his reel of 12 and his 14 on the same one across the sawhorses and 
it just be there to pull his home runs just as he needs them. And so, again, being efficient and setting something up up front, taking a few minutes to do that might make it much easier for that. So just different tips that save you a little time in the pool, especially if you're doing it yourself like this gentleman's working by himself. So. Now, see, that's going to the same place as the other one, and it's probably going to his other kitchen one. I probably would have pulled that at the same time. But that's just me. I'm, it's just me. Then before we go over there, we're going to smoke some more. But obviously, he has a one reel of 12, so again, that would make it hard for him to do that, right? You don't want it to pull off of that wheel because it'll get tight and it'll kind of become a bit. So I'm going to take this one to my other kitchen GFI. And remember, in all fairness, he just looks like he just has that one reel of 12, too. So again, obviously, we're talking about pulling multiples. Uh, I don't want to guesstimate it and end up being too short. Uh, I hate doing that. So you're going to have to do it like he did it if you only have one reel, okay? You know, most of us, when we're wiring it, we're going to have multiple uh, coils, 250-foot coils of 12.2 or whatnot. But if he's buying one big reel, uh, then he would be stuck with doing it just like this unless he, again, guesstimated. And we don't want to have waste so because guesstimate usually ends up in wastement. So he's doing it. Uh, the only the way he's doing it to, is nothing wrong with it, you know. He's using what he's got. And once again, on GFI circuits, you want to mark your line side. I'll show you how to do that when we get to cutting in. But for now, I'm just going to mark it or crimp it. So I'm taking this one to the dining. Also with the dining receptacles, I put the nook, so it goes the dining receptacles, the nook receptacles, the microwave, and the pilot light for the stove. It sounds like a lot, but... Okay, just to FYI to everybody out there, um, this would be going to the dining room. So this is a small appliance brand circuit. Okay, he's probably got, he's got the two that he's doing to serve the countertop. But again, the code says a minimum of two. He's adding additional one. He's going to be picking up the dining room. Now, what becomes an issue in many locations is picking up that microwave because most of the time the microwaves require an individual branch circuit. And since he's putting this on with other things, um, he'll have to address that. And, and it, it could be that his jurisdiction has no problem with that at all. And that's fine. Um, but he would have to run into issues that he might run into that uh, could be uh, adverse to what the instructions are in the microwave installation guide so again that's just what he's doing i'm not you know it must be acceptable in his area so he's doing it um the other thing that you got to worry about is uh, it's, it's very clear in the code what can and what can't be on a small appliance brand circuit okay so it's to serve receptacles and things like that um yes the microwave is a receptacle but uh, i think he's going to probably well, obviously, he's done many of these, so he's not having any problem in the jurisdiction that he's in. So he's just, that's just what he's doing. Um, but uh, again, some places would, would have a serious issue with that. Not really.
Okay. So real quick while we're at it, let's go back to talk about it. So what we're talking about is the small appliance and the receptacle outlets that are being served by those small appliance. So if you got your code book or you do at some point, you're going to be looking at 210.52B1. And it says, in kitchens, pantries, break room, uh, breakfast rooms, dining rooms, or similar areas of a dwelling unit, which he's covered, he's, he's talking about those areas. It says the two or more, and he's got more, uh, 20 amp small appliance brand circuits required by 210.11C1, so that's required a minimum of two, shall serve all wall and floor receptacle outlets covered by 210.52A. And if you go back and look at 210.52A, you'll notice that as you look at this, and this is talking about the wall spacing and floor receptacles, it says it shall cover those, all countertop receptacles covered by 210.52C, and receptacle outlets for refrigeration equipment, okay? So it doesn't give him the expressed permission to do the microwave on this, but again, we're going to assume that it is in his jurisdiction and they have no issue with it, um, but I will point you to the fact that that uh, B2 in 210.52 says the two or more small appliance brand circuits specified in 210.52 B1 shall have no other outlets. And the only exception to this was electric clocks. Uh, and there is an allowance to provide the application for like gas fired ranges and things like that. So uh, microwave doesn't come into play here. Uh, the other issue that could end up causing him issues, if an inspector gets kind of Let's just say they have a problem with it would be looking at the permissive loads in 210.23 uh, and the limitations you have on the circuits, whether it's uh, 80% for cord and plug connected equipment not fastened in place or utilization equipment fastened in place, which is then 50%. So I encourage people to be careful. And I think that 99.9% of the people out there probably run an individual brand circuit to the microwave. I'm just saying. All right, so just things to think about as we go through this. And when you're running long runs up in the ceiling, coded, you're supposed to have a staple every four foot. But as long as... Okay, I'll correct him here. When you're running non-metallic sheath cable in a 334.30... You need to make sure that you secure and support it. So generally, you support it uh, every four and a half feet. And by virtue of that, you'll be securing it also every four and a half feet. Now, if it runs through studs like the wall that's behind him, then it's considered secured and supported as it runs horizontally through those studs. Uh, if you run vertically with that stud or parallel with that stud, you're still going to meet the four and a half foot securement requirement. And typically, you're going to secure that N and B within 12 inches of a box if the box has a clamp. If it doesn't have a clamp and it's like a two and a quarter by four inch box, that's a simple car line like nail up box that you simply knock the knockout out of it. Then you're going to want to follow the rules in 314.17, I believe. And that's when it says that you have to put a securement within eight inches because there's no clamp at the box. So if there's a clamp in a box or even it's an internal clamp that's built into it that holds the cable in place, then you can go up to 12 inches for that first staple, if you will. And then you can go up to four and a half feet. Other thing I'll mention is that a lot of people think that when you go up above the ceiling and you run it across the top of those trusses or ceiling uh, uh, rafters, that you don't have to secure it still every four and a half feet. That is not true. Even though it's theoretically supported, it still has to be secured every four and a half feet. So all of that's in 334.30. Check it out, and uh, you'll get a better understanding. I don't know how many houses as a head of a jurisdiction electrically that I went into with my stick, and I'd go upstairs in their second floor, and I would poke the cables in the ceiling. And if they moved around, then I would fail them for that under 334.30, and of course, I'd be looking at other things in the house to give them enough time to go up there and put those staples where they needed to have them. Uh, I, I really, I didn't like to fail you, but if I had to, I'm going to walk around and usually give you enough time to fix those things, and then I'll come back and look at it. Uh, again, we, we don't want to make another visit. Most inspectors, if you think about it, we don't have the time to make multiple visits to a job site. So we'd rather you do it right. And so a, a good inspector 
will give you the time if they notice something. Now, if I go do an inspection and you're not there, well, then, you know, I, I got to do what I got to do. I got to fail you. But again, I'm going to give you a code reference. That's what every good inspector should do. Tell you what you did wrong. And that way, you know exactly what my expectations are. Okay. That's the way it should be. Anyway, it's not always that way, but that's the way it should be. As long as it's nice and tight and you're going across the trusses in a certain way, a lot of times people won't notice it. If it looks good. But see, if you're going long ways against it, there's no. I, I noticed the comment, Eric says, wires can't fall up. It's got nothing to do with that. It's the movement back and forth. Okay. They still can move. You've got to secure them in place. Right? It's not about falling. Right? It's, it's securement so they don't move. Uh, it's people climbing through and, and, and kicking them around and moving them around and things like that. Uh, that's the reason. Plus, code is code. So we have to, we have to do what the code wants. Sometimes it, you look at it and you go, I don't know why we're doing that. But again, there's precedent for it. And unless somebody puts in a change and has a justification for a change, uh, then, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. So, but I get you, <laughs> it's definitely not going to fall up, but it is going to move around. It's definitely, most certainly. But I get you, I get you. Let's get back to it. The way you can hide it. So you're going to have to put that staple over four foot. Four and a half feet, but four foot's okay. Four foot's within four and a half feet. So, hey, he likes four foot. That's good. He's not going to be code wrong. He, he'll pass code. Not knocking him. And we got another commercial coming up. Here's what you need. And I'll just pause that until the commercial's over and we'll get right back into it. And this was dining and microwave. Yep. This wire, I'm going to take to the washing machine. So this is the laundry circuit. It looks like they're all going, you know, it's about the same direction here. <laughs> this is girlfriend. You know what they say? Electricians that work together with their with their wives, uh, happy life, happy wife. Uh, that's not so true. I used to take my wife on a lot of jobs, and she got I got old really quickly. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, this is another DFI. But we don't have to mark it because it's just dedicated. There's nothing else on with it. Makes sense. Perfectly fine. That's a lot of extra cable, but hey. You already pulled it that far. Might as well go with it. Still doing very neat work. No problem with that. Okay, these TVIs can be kind of hard to pull through, so you just want to go ahead and pull you off a lot of slack, a little bit extra. I'm just trying to make it to the first bathroom that's closer. Now, if, if your run through these TGIs is long, one thing is they can be a pain in the butt. They usually are perforated so you can knock it out. Um, what I typically did, since they're being, the way they're being run and he's running them through them, so he's running parallel with them, I would t probably at this point pull enough cable and kind of walk it off to where the location is and pull that slack that way rather than pulling 10 feet and then having to pull 10 more feet, whatever. I would, as you're pulling it through here, I'd pull enough slack and then I would probably get down and I would pull it, kind of give me a, an idea of where, is, is, you know, where it's going as much as I need. And I would do that. That way I'm not pulling, 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 pulling slack. That time I, I'd pull what I think I need. Uh, not that he's doing anything wrong. I'm just saying that, that for me, just as I'm remembering back when I would do a lot of this, um, what I would do, I'd come off that ladder. I'd pull enough over to where I'm about where I think I need to be, uh, especially if it was a really long pull, uh, that type of thing. Especially if it's a straight shot and all I got to do is knock out the TGIs and knock out the perforated holes. Uh, that's what I would do.
PGIs have pre-cut holes in them, all you gotta do is bang them out with the hammer. Again, since this is a GFI, we have to mark it so we know what the line side is. Overall, he's, he doesn't have a lot of scrap, so it's good. For those that are very project management oriented and you don't want your guys just having all this slack, he's, he's not doing bad. is going to be for the furnace and it's all the way in the attic and I have a bonus so I have to run this one a little crazy. And I will say that his cable is probably on core wire and it comes with super slick elite already on it so that's why it's pulling through those uh, prefabs. Those, uh, they're, they're just pulling just like butter because again, it's probably on core wire with super slick applied to it. I'm just saying. Might be, I don't know. It looks like it's might be. How many out there have a Milwaukee whole hog cordless? I'm looking at one of those. What do you think? Worth the money? They look like they're a beast. I know what the basement king would say. Absolutely. For all you Milwaukee guys and gals out there. Ooh, they need to get that boot on that vent. Just before it rains, you know. So this wire is going to get hooked to this unit. And I have to put a switch in here that, you, that works as a disconnect. It's like a gas but unit. For now, as long as I got it here, it's good. Here's a goal. Here's a little tip for those who drive staples. Now, let me tell you what, I've been on some jobs and obviously for a wire and cable manufacturer, I have had to go on jobs. Uh, and as an inspector, people seem to think that you have to drive those things until the staple actually touches the cable. You do not. It's not supposed to embed it in place. It's just to keep it in place. So when we're running it in the middle of a two by four so that we maintain an inch and a quarter from each edge of the actual uh, framing of the stud, uh, we don't have to embed it, right? So don't get all whack happy, you know, and just bang, bang, bang that thing, okay? It just needs to be in. And in fact, I tell most people, if you can stay uh, an eighth of an inch or whatever away from the cable, you're good to go. And of course, staples come in various lengths. And again, some cable can hand, some strap uh, staples can handle two cables. Some are designed for one cable. Okay, again, but at the end of the day, you don't need to embed them into the wood, folks. You don't need to drive them. That's just there to hold it in place. That's it. As somebody already said here, it can't fall up, and it certainly is not going to fall out. But it has to keep it in place. Okay. I shouldn't have the need to say that, but I've been as many jobs as I've been on and seen how people drive those staples. You know, you wonder why does it pinch it? Why does insulation get cracked and everything? Because you're compressing it. And uh, so I just, just uh, don't do that. How about that? Awesome, Steven. Thank you. I thought those whole hogs would do pretty good. I used to have a Milwaukee right angle with an extension and a, and a six inch auger, and I loved it. Uh, but boy, I watched a guy do a video and he almost trimmed out and they cut board, uh, drilled the whole house with one of those okay, M18s. This home run is going to be for the garage receptacles, and usually I do that in 14, but 2020 code change says that it wants. All the garage receptacles and all the outside receptacles on one GFI in the garage. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to back up because I was running my mouth here. I want to hear what he just said. Home run is 
going to be for the garage receptacles. And usually I do that in 14, but 2020 code change says that it wants all the garage receptacles and all the outside receptacles on one GFI in the garage. Okay, so I'm not sure which code he's talking about when it comes to all the GFIs. So the rule is when it comes to the garage, so the branch circuit that's required in the garage is the 210.11C, and specifically for the garage, it's item number four. And that is one that you prerequisite is that you have a garage. Because if you don't have a garage, then obviously you wouldn't need the branch circuit for it. But let's assume, and he does, that you do have a garage. So you're going to run that 20 amp uh, branch circuit for that garage. Now, this branch circuit, now, I am assuming that he's in the 2017 code, but even if he was in the 2020 code, I'll go on and read it as if he's in the 2020 to give you some insight. It says, in addition to the number of branch circuits required by other parts of this section, and the other parts of this section are referring to the small appliance, the laundry, and the bathroom branch circuits. That's what it means by that. It says, at least 120 volt, 20 amp branch circuit shall be installed to supply receptacle outlets required by 210.52G1 for attached garages and in detached garages with electric power. This circuit shall have no other outlets. Okay, so in this scenario... It can only supply, in the 2020 code, by the way, it can only supply the receptacles that are serving the vehicle bay. Now, there is an exception to that that says this circuit shall be permitted to supply readily accessible outdoor receptacle outlets. Okay, So that circuit that is there to supply those vehicle bay receptacle outlets can also pick up readily accessible, okay, um, readily accessible outdoor receptacle outlets as well on that circuit, right? Um, so that's at least one. So you could have more than one 20 amp brand circuit out there. In fact, to be honest with you, once you have that 20 amp brand circuit to serve those vehicle bays, if I have a three car garage, I need three receptacle outlets, one for each vehicle bay. Um, I could bring another garage brand circuit and it wouldn't have to be 20 amp. It only needs to, it could only be 15 amp if you want, okay? To serve something else. Okay. The other thing to remember is the receptacles that are in the ceiling, if you have a garage door opener, in the 2020 code cannot be on that branch circuit that's serving those receptacles for the vehicle bay. Why? Because those receptacles that serve the vehicle bay under 210.52G1 cannot be higher than five and a half feet. So obviously they can't be in the ceiling. Okay. So that's the 2020 code. Just kind of give you some insight into that for those that are venturing into the 2020 or you're not there yet kind of give you a flavor of what's going on. But yes, GFCI would be required in there, that type of scenario. And on 12 wire. So normally I wouldn't put this one in, but. And it wasn't necessarily, might as well also mention, it wasn't a code change. I'm not sure what cycle he's under. Since his video was created in 2020, um, it's either 2020 NEC or 2017. Both of which, those two cycles required that the garage branch circuit, uh, where you had a garage, um, had to be 20 amp, at least one 20 amp. So that's not new. So um, I get where he's going, and he, he's probably not a code expert, and that's fine. He doesn't need to be. doesn't need to be. Uh, he just, he's got a working knowledge of it, and uh, he's putting 12 in, so he's good to go. Gustavo, thank you for joining. Smelly, thank you for joining. Steven, thank you for joining. Eric, thank you for joining. You need to relax. Not R. Kelly, again, if I didn't mention, thank you for joining. And now we're going to do the 14. Uh, these are track homes. And okay, so he mentioned that these are track homes, right? So he's done more than one of these. A lot of circuits together just because these houses don't pay a lot. This is kind of like one of those bare minimum contracts and we just kind of get away with whatever we can get away with. So all right, it's first of all kind of the wrong attitude, getting away with whatever you can get away with. Um I'm I'm going to translate that into meaning he understands that in a 15 amp brand circuit cuz he's using 14 gauge now that there's no m limit to the number of brand circuits, although we're using common sense approach. Uh, and, and maybe he has a rule of thumb where he's not going to put more than 10 to 12 on a 15. 
and he's not one more than 12 to 14 on a 12. Um, maybe or maybe not he has a rule of thumb. Remembering that 180 VA per strap doesn't apply to residential. Okay, for all you commercial guys and gals out there, again, you get your head into that commercial thing, and then you jump over into this residential thing, and it is different. Okay, you, you have to look at some things a little differently. Uh, but uh, I get what he's saying, and I think he's just trying to really say that he's trying to be cost-effective and efficient on how he runs his brand circuits and what he puts on those brand circuits. Is that a politically correct way of saying that, I guess? So let's see what he does. We combine, we combine bedrooms. Um, and a lot of stuff you normally wouldn't do in like a custom home or like a really big house. So anyways, let's get started. Hey, Jess, thanks for joining us today. Glad you could join us. Okay, on this circuit, I have the garage, the laundry, the foyer, the dining light, and the kitchen lights all on one circuit. I know it sounds like a lot, but when we go to trim this house out, most of the lights are going to be LED, and they don't take much power, so... So I'll make a comment on that. This is where times have really, really changed. Um, back when we used to do this and everything was incandescent, you had to be very conscious of the wattage when you're putting all the lighting. Because again, even though it's probably not all on at the same time, unless you have my son in your house, and then every light's on at the same time, maybe that's the same way in your house, um, those wattage doesn't go away. When it's on, it's on, right? So at the end of the day, the biggest issue is... If he's putting all the lighting on one, that's fine. But when people try to max it out and they put receptacles and the lighting and they try to, to, to really max it out in these in kind of these track homes, you do end up with issues. Like somebody ends up getting a computer and it's uh, they're a gamer these days and they plug it into the bedroom and it ends up tripping a breaker because you have lighting on and, and a lot of lights and then you have the receptacles and the bedroom on it. And so again, you really have to plan it out. So his approach here is he looks like he's just doing this circuit for the lighting. So if you think about the rooms that he said, and I said that you put upwards of 10 to 12 as a rule of thumb, you got to remember that his wattage is because they're LEDs, and he's kind of made that statement, so that means they've done this before, uh, that the wattage is going to be pretty darn low. So he's, he can get away with that. And But back in the day, we couldn't get away with that because it was incandescence everywhere. But things have changed uh, and so again, you can get away, obviously put more things on a circuit because of technology and what we can do today, uh, with LEDs and things like that. Not really a big deal. So I got the end of my circuit right here at the, uh, garage switches. Now, in all fairness, in all fairness, earlier when I said that I usually run my circuits first before I pull the home runs, um, if you look at his video and you look as he's going around pulling these home runs, I think he said that he's pulling his home runs first, but I think he is basically recording it in reverse order. Because if you look at it, I think he has pulled his circuits through the branch circuits through the rooms already. So he's just speeding up in this episode to do the home runs. And he's probably going to do this, the other stuff in the next video, you know, part six or part seven. Um, so keep that in mind. Cause we talked about the approach that I have and you probably had, whereas I go around and, and, and basically run my circuits. So I and mark where my home runs going to be that way. The worst nightmare for an electrician, the worst nightmare is the forgetting of a home run, right? And if you start with running your home runs first, you could forget that even though you should see where the home run is. Um, 
And my brother used to spray paint on a stud or something that would mark where the home runs were. That way he didn't forget or mark it on the floor. Uh, but again, I think that he has already run a lot of his circuits around his rooms and then he, he's doing the home runs. So uh, like I said earlier, I would never run the home runs first and I'm going to get the feeling that he didn't do that either. Okay. Based on what I see in the receptacles there and the wire pull and the receptacles, things like that. I, I'm going to get that feeling that he didn't do that either. Next circuit. This is going to be my master Master bedroom, master bath, and smoke detector. Once again, it sounds like a lot on one circuit, but the smoke detectors don't really pull like any power at all. Interesting fact: uh, the the smoke alarms that are in residential, okay. Uh, smoke detectors are used in an interconnected system that has a reporting system. Smoke alarms have an audible, localized audible on the smoke alarm. Uh, we know what we're talking about when we say it, and, and I've done it before. But remember, when we're talking residentials, we're talking smoke alarms. It actuates from the actual smoke alarm, and they're interconnected. Okay. Whereas on the uh, smoke detector system, it's typically what you'd see in multifamily or commercial, and it all ties back. And they'll typically use NFPA 72 and follow all those rules. You don't really have that kicking in in residential. Uh, most of the receptacle, and we've talked about it in a previous uh, episode, if you go back and look at, I think it's episode four, we talk about, again, placement of those. And it's usually going to be in the International Residential Code. And it's going to give you ideas. Plus, you get a manual with the smoke alarms that tells you how far away from a peak you have to have it and all that. But placement-wise, International Residential Code will tell you per floor within 10 feet of bedrooms, one within the bedroom, each bedroom, and all those type of things um, are all something that you would cover in the IRC, International Residential Code, that type of thing. When I go to run the, the uh, master bedroom and ma master, ba master bathroom circuit, I'll just pull power off the closest smoke, usually the one that's in the room. And then I'll put the home run to the closest smoke detector. So once again, it doesn't matter which smoke detector you go to because they're all connected anyways. A little tip, uh, tip may be a tip, may not be a tip. Um, when I put in the, the smoke alarm circuit, uh, I was always, for me, that was always a dedicated. And it would always end it in, in a box in the attic. And since it was um, really no loads really on it with the, with the, with the smoke alarms, um, but it was always also the availableness to be a spare if needed because there was nothing on it. Uh, some places, again, they, you know, that's a home run you'd have to run. Uh, but so people are like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Um, but as you're looping your, your, your uh, smoke alarms together, some people, you know, might hit the box and then jump up and put the uh, run a 14 two from it and put it up into a junction box in the attic. So it allows you access to this circuit. If you're only going to be supplying the smoke alarms, you hit 14.2 to the first one and jump 14.3 to each additional one, but come out of that first box and then jump and put a uh, blanked off box in the attic. Yes, it needs a cover. Can't be a, just an open junction box. Um, so that's just some of the things that I would do. Um, they're not going to pay me to put another uh, extra brand circuit in, but I had no problem running it and doing the smoke alarms and then ending it or, or popping up and put the junction box and blank cover it in the attic as a spare circuit. I no problem with that. So we got a smoke detector right here in this bedroom. This is the closest one to the panel. Eventually, I'll have to run the three wire and connect them all up. And all the smoke detectors have to be ran. All the smoke detectors have to be ran in 14 three wire. 
because it also carries a red wire, which is a signal for all of them. So if one of them goes off, it makes sure that all of them go off together. Right. So we call that the interconnect. So that's the interconnect signaling to all of them. When one goes off, the others go off. Yep. There we go. Now see his other cables ran everywhere. So that tells me he had already done that wiring. So he, uh, now, when he so said earlier, connectors. when he said earlier that he's doing his home runs first, he really did. Okay. He had already done the wiring and that made total sense. Cause I would not have to fathom where to run my home runs if I haven't yet ran my circuit. We don't know if we're going to get jack studs. We're going to have four studs. We might have to change directions. Uh, you just never know yet. So, again, I saved the home runs to last, and I think he did too. He's just doing his video out of sequence. And this is the one important thing, that you've got to know what your inspectors want from you because some inspectors want this to be on a dedicated circuit. Well, he's talking about his the the smoke alarm. I would prefer to have the microwave on the dedicated circuit than I am worried about the smoke alarm. Uh, although I have heard rumors in different parts of the country with jurisdictions who again can modify and supplement the the NEC in their jurisdiction, I have seen people want them to be on lighting circuits uh, in a kitchen, for example. Uh, and all that kind of stuff so that when the kitchen lights are out, you know that the smoke alarms are not working, uh, things like that. But typically they got battery backup and how long does your power off anyway? Not too long. So, but again, I've heard different things throughout the country, different things that local jurisdictions modify and supplement based on local rules. Uh, so always be aware that there is a potential for local. Uh, the NEC is one thing, but you could have your state or even your municipality add amendments to uh, the minimum safety standard, making it more restrictive, if you will. And electrical inspectors are assholes. You might think, like, I think that... Okay. Um, now, how do I comment on that? Um, some electrical inspectors have a chip on their shoulder. Some um, maybe were electricians and had trouble with inspectors, and so they became a bad inspector. Uh, I would certainly, by and large, say that electrical inspectors are not a-holes. Um, but if you go at them hard and, and you really push something, and God forbid you're wrong, but you really push it, it's like messing with a pig in mud. They, they like it. I mean, I'm not going to lie. As an inspector, I, I had the authority but my job was to enforce the code. My job wasn't to make up code. My job wasn't to enforce things that are not in the code. My job wasn't to enforce my opinion. That was, that's your job to do the install. I'm just looking for minimum safety. So it tells me he's had some run-ins with an inspector. Uh, but at the end of the day, the inspector is there to be the last line of defense to make sure it's as compliant. Um, and at the end of the day, he's not there to match wits. He's there to determine whether something meets the minimum safety standard. Now, people hate that term, minimum safety standard. But it is. If you install it with this NEC, it is minimally safest structure you can get. Can you go above this and do more? Absolutely. Absolutely. But this is the minimum. You've got to at least meet this. That's what minimums mean for everybody that gets bent out of shape about the term minimum safety standard. It's the minimum. If you don't meet this, guess what? You fail. Sounds like a minimum to me. You have to meet this. If you meet this code book, then you can always add more. It's like, for example, if it's two small appliance brand circuits, but I want to put three, well, the code says you don't have to have it. Two is the minimum. I can put three. I can put four. I can put five. Whatever I need, but I have to meet the minimum, okay? So I'm not sure why that gets people crazy when we use that term minimum safety standard because that's what it is. Um, obviously, there are better inspectors than others, just like there's better electricians than some. Some are better than others, again, like that. Some don't care about their work. Some take a lot of pride in their work. Um, again, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. At the end of the day, are all electrical inspectors a-holes like this gentleman states? Absolutely not. I know quite a few of them, great people, and they want to learn too. But every now and then you get bad apples in anything that we do.
there's bad apples in there. Okay, so uh, that's just his opinion. They think that they are better than us or like they know what's really going on, but they are not electricians. Uh, that's not true either. A lot of inspectors are electricians or were electricians or still electricians, uh, but there's some in jurisdictions that are not. So again, so that's a pretty broad statement he's saying. Uh, I, obviously, I don't agree with it. Um, and anytime I did an inspection, I would never fail you unless I could provide you with a code reference. So, uh, and I employ all of you electrical inspectors out there that might watch or, or view this video later. If you're going to fail somebody, do them the common decency and courtesy to provide them with an accurate code reference. Let them know why you're failing them. And also it lets them know what they got to fix. And then maybe he'll learn something in the process, but also electrical inspectors. If you're, do, if you're imposing your own will or something and you're wrong, it's okay. Accept it, learn from it, move on and grow from it. All right. But uh, I never, um, it, it's not worth calling them that what he calls them because it, this is not true. And there are some great electrical inspectors out there. So, uh, and, and there's some bad ones. No lie. I know some electrical inspectors who were floor sanders before they became an electrical inspector. A little scary, but they did their best to learn. So anyway, doing the best we can. They're just book smart. They're not out here in the field doing what we're doing. <laughs> Maybe they have. You don't know that. Like we know what works, so don't let them tell you how to do your stuff. I'm now, Lance. Uh, well, you better follow them if you want to get your inspection done. I'll, I'm going to just put it that way. Uh, but don't be afraid to challenge an inspector. Uh, in the comments, uh, let's see, uh, I think it's, is it Lloyd was asking Eric about, uh, um, it's perfectly okay to, to hit these smoke alarms on a bedroom circuit. Again, smoke alarms don't pull anything. Um, again, so, you know, many people will take a circuit and just pop it right up and do it and that type of thing. So, again... Um, and again, for me, it was always a dedicated circuit for the smoke alarms only because I wanted to run from the first box up into the attic so that I could put a box and a cap on it for a spare circuit rather than running a whole new spare circuit. That was good enough for me, uh, that type of thing. But everybody's different. Everybody has their own way of doing it. And it certainly would be okay to pop off and put it on a bedroom circuit or something like that. Okay. Now, remember, since the smoke alarm is an outlet in the bedroom anyway, depending on what cycle, all the way back to when we started doing outlets in the 20, uh, 2002 code, because in the, 2000, in the 1999, it was only receptacle outlets in the bedrooms. And then we started expanding with AFCI, so it's going to be AFCI required anyway. So what, is it, what does it matter? You know what I'm saying? Anyway. Uh, but again, be careful with your jurisdiction. They might have their little nuances that you got to follow, even though they might supersede the code. If you want to get your work done, then it's pay. It, 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 it rewards you to understand what amendments it, you might have in your jurisdiction. Just call them up and say to the inspector, do we have any amendments for this jurisdiction? And where can I get a copy of them? You know what I'm saying? That type of thing. So, but absolutely. So they are definitely going to be on AFCI. This home run right here, I have two, I have a bedroom two and bedroom three on together with the hall back and hall. Now we're hoping what he means, if you're with me here, he's doing the two bedrooms and he does the bathroom and the hall that he's talking about the lighting. And obviously he's not talking about the receptacles for that. Obviously, right? Because we know what the code requires for our bathrooms. 20 amp, okay, at least one. Of course, we can go hit, we could take one home run and hit all the bathroom receptacles and loop them through and be done as long as we don't cover any lighting on that circuit. But the code also gives us an allowance for doing what? Taking a branch circuit to one bathroom and hitting the lighting and the receptacles in that bathroom with that 20 amp circuit as long as we do not leave that bathroom with that circuit. But if I'm just going to hit receptacles, 
then I can run one brand circuit and hit all the receptacles in the bathrooms and I'd still be okay. Okay. So again, I'm assuming when he made that statement and since he's pulling 14, two, I'm assuming he's talking lighting only. So in the receptacles and lighting in the bedrooms, he's good, but he's picking up the hall lighting and he's picking up the bathroom lighting, which is probably just one valence light or something like that. So I'm okay with that. Knowing that he's not going to hit any receptacles in the bathroom. And we're going to have to assume that, that he's not, but I'm pretty, hopefully he's not. We'll see where he goes with that. Or even if he says anything about it. Okay. These are the two bedrooms I'm talking about with that bathroom. Now you notice, you notice, have- you notice everybody that he does have the wiring run around the walls. So again, for clarification, he did not run the home runs first and then scramble afterwards. He ran his circuits. He knew where his home runs needed to be. And so then he can target where his home runs need to be. Okay. Just for clarity. Two power wires already in this receptacle. I'm just going to go ahead and add a third wire in there because I don't want to run through these TGIs. I'm, I don't mind pigtailing some wires if it just saves me a little bit of time. I mean, obviously, with me talking right now, I could have already done it and ran it over there to that switch box, but... All right, so let's talk about that real quick. Since we're here, uh, he's going to put three cables in that box. So he's going to put three 14 twos. okay? So let's assume that that is a Carlon cheapy, you know, the, the entry, I, I like to say entry level, 18 cubic inch car line. Now this might be a 22, but let's just say it was 18. So for craps and giggles, we want to see if he's okay. So he's going to put a receptacle in there. And he's going to be putting three cables in there. So what would his box fill be just for craps and giggles since we're here today and we're doing that again, didn't anticipate that, but I said, you know what, I'm going to roll with it. So if we go look at 314.16 and we're going to look at table 314.16B. So this is 14 gauge. So 14 gauge has a cubic inch volume of looks like 2.00, correct? So in that box, he's going to have three blacks, three whites, and we've only got three equipment grounds. So it's four or less. So it's going to be treated as one. So what has he got in there? And he's got a device. So it seems like he's got, and obviously that's going to go over to the receptacle. So he's got 2.00. So 2.00. And how many do we say he have? Three blacks, three whites. So that's six. One equipment ground, that's seven, right? And then he's going to have a double volume for the receptacle, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So that's nine total overall conductors, right? So two, so, so that would be, if we're counting it out, it'd be two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 cubic inches. So he is right there at it. So the maximum that he could have in there was three, 14 twos. Okay. And again, just to, so you're clear on that. If he did 2.00 times six, that's 12. That takes care of the blacks and the whites plus 2.00 for the equipment ground. And then he's going to give to a double volume for the device, which is 2.00 plus 2.00. And so again, so that's 12 plus, uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then he's got plus the double volume for that device, 14. 15, 16, 17, 18, again, so double checking, 18 cubic inches, he can put a receptacle in there, he can have those three 14 twos in there, and he's good to go, All right? Now, that is 18 cubic inch. If that right there happened to be a box that he was bringing 12 into, then he would have a problem if it was 18 cubic inches, wouldn't he? Because if you look at 314.16b, you're gonna see that, that it's 2.25 cubic inches, for that. So again, things you have to think about if you're using a simple nail up, you got to know what the cubic inch is in there. Um, and so if he was doing it with uh, uh, a uh, 12 gauge, we've got six, seven, eight, nine overall conductors. So it would be 2.25 times nine. Remembering, of course, that a device basically replicates a double volume or two conductors. So that's 20.25. So he has more volume than the box could handle if it was an 18 cubic inch. So you replace it with a 22 cubic inch nail up. So again, just the lesson here is to think about what you're putting in a box. And again, if you just go with the 18 cubic inches, he'd be all right with the 14, 
But anywhere else that he's doing with 12, for example, he'd have a problem, that type of thing. So just, just things to think about, you know, kind of a little lesson while we were there. Stephen, I have no idea where the job's located, so we're probably commenting on 2020. Uh, he, he, I don't know where he is in the country. So with stapling coming down the wall, you need to staple within 12 inches of the top plate and then every four foot down the wall from that. Okay, so I'm not sure where he's getting the 12 inches from. Uh, it is four and a half feet, but his four, his four feet's okay. That's okay. Um, just like when he did the panel in episode four, um, it might be that his jurisdiction requires that it's within 12 inches of a top plate. Uh, that's not what the code says. Um, it is every four and a half feet. So, and then again, 12 inches from a box, unless of course it's a two and a quarter by four inch nail up box with no clamp built into it. Then he would have to secure it within eight inches. Okay. So different rules. But I'm not sure where his top plate thing comes from. It might be local jurisdiction. But just remember, non-metallic sheet cable, securing it every four and a half feet. That's the rule. That's the maximum. Now, he's doing it every four feet. That's okay. He's doing it less than four and a half feet. Perfectly fine. And he's not breaking any rules there. And he's okay. You, be honest with you, you could put it every foot if you want it. Uh, but wh why would you, right? Um, and then within the box, you'll need one within 12 inches also. And again, some inspectors want you to staple within six inches of a box. Okay. So just to, just to clarify him and clarify everybody, it's not the inspectors wanting. Now he danced all around the distances, but it's 12 inches from the box. If the box has a clamp or some kind of internal clamping system, it could be just the plastic flaps. If you have the nail-up boxes that you totally knock it out and it's just a hole, then you have to have a staple within or a, a strap or what have you within eight inches, okay? And for those that say, where does it say that in the code? Well, then you need to go back and look at in the code. And I don't know what's, which one am I in here. Um, well, it's in 314.17, but you want to look at B2, and that's going to give you the exception. And the exception is what talks about a two and a quarter by four inch box. So other than that, you use the rules that are in 334.80, excuse me, 334.30 for securing and supporting. But under this rule, since the cables are not being connected to the box, then if it's a two and a quarter by four inch box, like what he's got here, then you're going to make sure you secure it within eight inches. Now, could it be at six? Could it be at five? Could it be at four? Could it be at seven? Absolutely. But the maximum you can go is eight inches. His jurisdiction, they're telling you that they want it at six inches. Okay, again, unless it's something that's adopted by the jurisdiction, that might be the inspector imposing his own will. But maybe the inspector just doesn't know that you can go up to eight inches. So this gentleman's wrong, and maybe his inspector's wrong. So maybe they will watch this video, and they will understand that they could go up to eight inches. But if you do it within six inches, you're going to be still compliant. So um, his inspector's just trying to keep him compliant. That's all I'm saying. But he said 12 inches. Now, that would be true if there was an internal clamp or some kind of clamping on this box that held that cable to the box. Chances are these look like these are just knock the back hole out the back, but it could be a clamp. But I know that these two gangs over here, do have the clamping mechanism in them, and then you would go 12 inches of these boxes. Absolutely. So again, depends on your box. So a little bit of extra education there for you. I like to save stapling for last. That's the way I do things. I'm not telling anybody else how to do their work. I love you too. Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. <laughs> okay. Oh, you wasn't talking to her. Okay. <laughs> and also remember, folks, that all of those cables that are running across those trusses up there 
will still need to be secured every four and a half feet. Or if he wants to do it every four, that's fine. Okay. Just because they're running across the top, that doesn't meet the code. Just so you know. And again, he said he's going to do his stapling after all this. So I am more than sure he's going to get up there and put those staples in there. Okay. You want to label this bedroom two, bedroom three? All right. <laughs> I hear you, Marcus. <laughs> uh, that's true. What we try to do as electricians is at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, we get all the other trades to line up and, and bow in front of us uh, as the superior trade. We get that. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to throw a little I love you out there once in a while. You know, do it through the inspector. It might go a long way. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, that is one tip I'll tell you. Um, a lot of electricians, and I go and I would see jobs or even my guys back when we were doing it, are we, is that pulling it out of the actual coil from the inner part of a 250-foot roll puts that coil on it. It's a pain in the butt, and it's, it's nasty to have to sit there and flip it out. Um, so much easier to pull it from the outside and put it on a Lazy Susan or put it on something that spins uh, so that you have it coming off nice and neat. Uh, and a lot of times pulling it through board holes or pulling it over, if you pull it and there's tension on it, you can rip the jackets and things like that. And again, while there is a repair method for the sheathing, the jacketing, um, there is a repair method for that, uh, like a 3M scotch tape or the scotch guard tape, whatever they call it. It's 3M. It's designed to fix cables. Um, you still got to have the fact that the, uh, the inspector will see that and then you have to explain it and it becomes a problem. Uh, because a lot of them will say that, you know what, you're installing damaged product. They won't take into account that it got damaged during the install. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are repair methods. You contact the manufacturer. We will tell you there's a repair method for sheathing, not for conductors that are damaged, but sheathing. And we'll supply a letter to the U that you can give to the AHJ uh, if it comes to that. But the best thing to do is get you a method to pull that cable off so that you don't have that constant tension on the sheathing to run the risk of it ripping. Now, I get it. Some of the pulls are just inevitable. But just think about it, and I like how he's doing it uh, in his setup. I also remember uh, somebody that I know that used to have, two, like, two bookends. So they were like a, I can't remember, it was two by sixes, and it had uh, on, on a base, and it had drill holes through it. And he would put EMT through it, and he would hang his reels of his 1,000-foot uh, uh, reels of NMB on it, and that's how he would, would pull it, that type of thing. Um, so there's different ways to do it. You can buy things pre-made, but again, it's so much easier to get that thing rolling off straight like that. It just makes a much easier run, and it makes it easier to pull. All of us manufacturers of NMB will put some type of lubricant or something on the sheathing to try to help the pull, but it's still pointless if you're pulling it under tension and trying to jam it through something so again understand it boring your holes properly getting around those corners i get it but the, the little effort can can help save a lot of headache Yeah, Stephen makes a comment, you know, while we might hate amendments, at least if you get amendments that aren't, take Pennsylvania, for example. Pennsylvania is all over the place. You don't know which county you're going to drive in and get something different. Um, Texas is the same way, kind of, that Massachusetts, Stephen, whereas that the northern part of Texas adopts any amendments. And luckily, two, a cycle ago, I was able to get most of those squashed. I was like, why do y'all even need these? Just follow the code, you know? Um, so it, uh, it, it, and believe it or not in Texas for years, they didn't observe the six disconnect rule. They allowed you to have 30 disconnects in one location. 
And I was like, really? The six disconnect rules for a reason. And they thought it would cause a lot of grief to all of a sudden follow the code. But I convinced them that code is code. Do they want to be responsible for something that goes wrong? So they ended up changing these amendments. But when they make an amendment, they submit it. And it's still up to the local jurisdictions to accept those amendments. Uh, They can choose not to and go with the state, which doesn't do any amendments. The state says the code is the code, right? Um, But local jurisdiction has a right to do amendments. So uh, different ways to, to, to approach it. Just be aware of your area and what you're working with. Thanks, Marcus. I, I thought my voice kind of makes me sound like I'm a teenager or something like that, which would totally be way off for me. Appreciate it, though. Another misconception I'll just throw out while we're here anyway is how many NMBs can you take through a hole, a board hole, or, or through a you know, hole that's in the stud? The NEC does not tell you how many. But what it does say that you can't damage the non-metallic sheath cable. So if you try to jam too many cables through a hole and it damages the cable, that's a problem. But it doesn't say that you stop at two, stop at three, stop at four, um, because you can bore different size holes, obviously. Uh, but one thing to be aware of is when it comes to NMB, as you start taking it through board holes, and if you happen to come in contact with thermal insulation, like might be in an attic, as you go through board holes or over top plates when you're coming down into a panel, um, you got to be careful because when you start getting more than two uh, cables with two or more current carrying conductors, then you have to start doing um, some adjustments and things like that. So have to be aware of that. So again, a lot of people will say, okay, I'm only going to allow two cables per board hole. That way they're trying to get around any significance of an adjustment to take place in the code. Um, but again, there is no rule about how many cables you can take to a board hole. Now you might have a local rule, but as far as the NEC is concerned, no, you just can't damage the non-metallic sheath cable. That's the key. No damage. That's what we were looking for. Steven says, KY lube the hole. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be using, I'm not sure I'm going to be using KY jelly on uh, wood trusses and or wood studs, but hey, you do you, Steven. I guess you had some left over. I don't know. <laughs> Um, actually good point here. I want to make Steven. Um, that's another thing that I'll address for those that are in watching that, that see the chat. Um, he says it uses excuse that don't rough in houses below 32 degrees cause it splits the wire when we install it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So theoretically when you have PVC, um, the PVC typically you don't want to install it in minus 10 degrees. Now, If you have thermoset, like an XHHW-2, you can go down to minus 40 degrees. Uh, But the reality is that sheathing is PVC. And so if you're going to be doing it in a temperature, again, in this case, 32 degrees or even lower, uh, anytime you're going to be freezing or lower, then you want to acclimate it to the condition. So I would keep all of my NMB in a above freezing environment until the time that I'm going to install it. So keep it, you know, wrapped up, keep it, uh, don't leave, obviously with the cost of NMB today, you ain't leaving that on a job site. I can promise you that, right? Um, But keep it at your house or wherever you're at, your warehouse, your office or whatever, uh, above freezing until the time of install. And then you have a good working frame that you shouldn't have any problem. The only problem you have with PVC or any type of PVC type of sheathing is when you leave it and it sits for any given time, in the cold weather. Uh, And so we always, as a manufacturer, recommend that you acclimate the actual cable or conductors or whatnot. Uh, Stay above freezing for at least 24 hours prior to install. And then when you go out on the install, 
Um, you could install it in as low as minus 10 degrees. Again, as long as that cable or wire has been acclimated to it uh, for or, or been conditioned to above freezing for 24 hours it, prior to the install. Okay. So then it shouldn't be, shouldn't be too much of an issue. Right. At least then for me and I was in Virginia and we did quite a few installs that were below freezing, but we never left the NMB there. Uh, it was always above freezing and kept in that place before we did it. Other than the fact we just didn't like installing in cold weather, but I can remember my brother having all of us having these kerosene, like uh, these big bullet engine, you know, these kerosene heaters and it kept it sweaty in that place, even though it was really cold, uh, then it's, it's not a big deal. But again, yeah, PVC has a cracking Typically doesn't happen until it gets down to minus 10. But that doesn't mean that it becomes uh, worse when you uh, try to pull it around corners. But I will tell you, with Uncle Wires NMB, since we apply the Super Slick Elite to the surface of the cable assembly, as it gets colder, it actually pulls better. The problem with some products that have emulsification or the pulling lubricant comes out of the sheathing, as it gets colder, it can have a negative effect on that in my experience. Uh, whereas the topicals that get applied to it uh, will uh, still allow it to pull okay. So you still have the bit of the pulling that you have as everything's good. So just, you know, things to think about. And I know we don't like to work in freezing anyway. So maybe that is, as Steven says, maybe that's the best excuse. Hey, boss, it's 32 degrees, pulling no NMB today. <laughs> He'll send you somewhere else. Watch. He'll send you to dig a ditch or something. I'm just saying. I'm not sure what PFAS is, uh, Seth, sorry. And when you're pulling through TGIs, do not drill your own holes. I mean, you can see right here, these guys that were doing the plumbing, they drilled their own holes for the thing, and there are certain rules that apply to drilling your own holes in TGI. But just to stay safe in, in, in a code, you want to knock out the knockouts that are already there because if you mess up, you can fail for, uh, I forget what it's called, but what will happen is if they fail you for that, they'll have to get an engineer out here and he'll have to tell you what to do. And if they have to pull this apart and replace a TGI, you're talking a lot of money. All right, so let me address this real quick. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with drilling through those. Um, if it has a perforated, there typically could be an inch or three quarter. You knock them out. If you choose not to knock them out and you want to drill through it, I, that really is not going to affect it. I think one of the things that he probably is more alluding to is the drilling through things like laminated beams. So if I have laminated beam headers or, or things like that, or supporting loads and things like that, um, there are rules in where you can drill and where you can't, but I'm going to tell you, if it comes to an engineered beam or a laminated beam, uh, do your way, your best to go around it. Uh, and if you have to drill through it, seek, seek the building engineer or somebody, the, the general contractor, and do this. I'm just telling you from my experience, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, you can drill through these, okay? Um, and I can tell you this, that a lot of times, if you're asked, how in the world would a duck guy get through these? So they end up drilling a series of holes so they can knock it out so they can pull their ducting through it. So trust me, from an electrician standpoint, uh, a three quarter uh, or, or, or one inch, you know, bore through there is not going to cause a problem. Okay. But at the end of the day, if you've got the prefabbed holes, just knock them out. The only time that I didn't do that is when they put those up and the holes weren't lined up and it would have caused a zigzag and I'm not pulling my cable through a zigzag. So if that was the case and I used to use my, you know, right angle drill with my Milwaukee extension with my auger, six inch auger on the end and I would just boom, 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 boom and make my own holes. Um, ain't no way. If those TGIs don't, uh, or those, those beams don't line up through the perforated holes, I am not going to be trying to follow these holes. I'm just saying, okay? Um, so, again, but I think he's more talking about laminated beams, 
that are being used in, in certain things. And there's a lot of homes where that laminated beam is holding a large amount of, of weight. And, you know, if you've got laminate engineered beams like that, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be drilling through those without some guidance. And uh, because once you drill it, you own it. So, you know, just things to think about. Remember, it's, it's not always just on you, man. I'm a big believer in diverting liability to other people. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm going to drill through something like that and I have to get from point A to point B, I'm going to say, dude, all right, you, you, carpenter or general contractor, are you okay for me to drill through this laminated beam? And chances are they're going to be like, uh, maybe, maybe not. But then you can go consult with the engineer or the designer, whoever engineered that beam, and they might say, sure, as long as it's within this distance and it's in the middle third. And But I'm not doing it as an electrician until I bring somebody else in, right? Now, with these here that you've knocked the hole out of it with the particle board between them or the press board between them, chipboard, dude, I'm drilling those. I'm just saying. Like a lot of money, and it can really screw up a project, and that's what you're going to need your insurance for. See those plumbing pipes that go through there? I can guarantee you those weren't perforated because usually they're a certain size. So they had to drill those. Look at that. Look at that duct going through one. That's almost taking up the entire span. So probably miscommunicated what he was his intention there, but. Okay, so if you look right here, above, there's a laminated beam. That now, is what you got to be careful with. Laminated beam is probably not anything special, but I I seriously do not recommend drilling. Spectral presents. Okay, so I, I think, and that's where he was actually going when he was talking about it, rather than talking about those I beams and, and, and drilling through that, you know, that chipboard, I think he really was focusing on laminated beams because he knew he was going to encounter one to have this little conversation. Uh, those are the ones, if you can, as an electrician, you do what you want. But for me, I found a way around them. I just avoided them. Okay. That type of thing. Um, is the sense there is a laminated beam. Now, it's just a small laminated beam. It's probably not anything special, but I, I seriously do not recommend drilling them at all. I mean, but if you have to, the rule of thumb is the center third by the center third is where you can drill. And you have to stay at least the width of the hole that you're drilling apart from it. But it's such a danger zone that I wouldn't recommend drilling them at all. So I'm just gonna avoid it and go in this heavy. Again, get your guidance from uh, the, the general contractor, the carpenter, uh, whoever engineered that before you do it, just ask somebody. Divert responsibility onto somebody else or do yourself a favor, just avoid it. <laughs> It might mean you got to run a little more, you know, it might mean you got to run a little more cable, but hey, you know, a lot better than getting into an argument on how you got to replace a laminated beam, that's for sure.
And he's got one of those M18 whole hogs there, so still getting it. Funny thing I'll mention, guys. I have never, you know, I've never roughed in a house, and I did a lot of houses. Um, I never used a cordless. Everything was extension cord and Milwaukee right angle with an extender on it. Yada. My brother does them with cordlesses, and you're going to laugh, but he uses Ryobi with the Irwin bits and gets through them fine. Um, I'm not dating myself, but even today, I would... Um, the last house that I roughed in was probably before I left Virginia and uh, it was a full basement that I did uh, before I left and came out here, uh, a full job rather than stuff that I've done out here, um, which I didn't need anything big like that. But I ended up using the uh, right angle bit with my Milwaukee with the, an extension on it and I've never used a cordless uh, to do a whole house like this. Right? And now I just, I wouldn't, but you know, people do. He does, and I'm sure a lot of y'all do. So, again, cordlesses have come a long way. I'm telling you. I guess battery technology has come a long way. Right? Steven, do I still use metal? Yeah, when necessary. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do rough ends anymore, Steven. I'm a code guy now. Remember, everybody says I'm an electrician that can't do anymore, so I'm just a code guy. still do some side work, Stephen. Yeah. So, but I, it's more of an image for me to give people that think that I'm just sit behind the camera and don't do any work anymore. So it's, I've gotten soft. So it's, I like to per perpetuate that image for people. They seem to like that. Again, he puts all of his in prior to stripping I, me when I ran them over and I put them down like that uh, I put in one at a time as I stripped it and and then put it in uh, so again it just was the way I did it he puts all his in and now he's got to go in and the reason I didn't like this is because when you have a bunch of them I have been on jobs where the guys go into boxes and cut the boxes in after the cable is already in the box and I had to go find some issues that were having faults Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story. They were having faults that were causing breakers to trip and arc faults to go off and all this stuff. And so I went out there and started doing an analysis of what was going on. And what I found out was that when they were cutting their sheathing off of their uh, cables in the boxes, so they were putting them in the boxes with the cable still on it. And I know you all, a lot of you do this. You reach in there and you slice it and you're cutting it from inside with your knife and, and your, or whatever and trying to put it off. Well, what they were doing is they were putting cuts in the insulation and they literally were cutting it all the way down to the conductor because they couldn't control the pressure. They're just in there going, trying to get the sheathing off and cut the paper. Uh, and what was happening is they would create micro cuts in the insulation and depending on its proximity, um, it was causing problems creating arcs. Uh, and depending, it was a load intensive issue maybe on that circuit that caused that. But when I started analyzing it, they were actually damaging the insulation. Now, majority of the time, it's probably, you know, really thin cuts in there. And it's probably on the other side of an equipment ground and not an issue. But I did run into an issue and I identified that they shouldn't be stripping their boxes like that. Um, so, again, I don't want to work in that little space. So I pull my cable up to it. I hold it up to the, to the point where it goes in the back of the box and I go about an inch more and I mark it. I put my knife on it. I strip it off, get rid of the sheathing. Then I push it down in there. Remember the non-metallic sheath cable has to go into the box quarter of an inch, right? But can it go in three quarters of an inch? Sure. It can go in more. It's fine. 
But at the end of the end, by the way, if you ended up cutting it a little short on the sheathing, the non-metallic sheath cable does stretch pretty decently. So if you were to grab it and then you just kind of work it from your hand down and stretching it a little bit, you can stretch out and get about a quarter of an inch or, or half an inch if you need to get it in the box and be compliant and you'll be okay. All right, so at the end of the day, I just rather strip the sheathing off of it before I put them in the boxes. But everybody to each his own, just be careful when you go forging in there with knives. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Everybody to each his own. Okay, so a little bit of uh, things of thoughts here. And I'm just mentioning this because we really don't know what he's doing at the end, but I'll just throw it out there. So he's doing the two bonus rooms, doing the hall lighting. That's not a problem. It's a bonus room. But he mentioned the bathroom. So I'm going to assume here that he's only going to do the bathroom lighting and not the bathroom receptacle because that wouldn't work. First of all, that's a 14-2, so that'd be a problem. So the bathroom. And so he could be putting the receptacle on with the other bathroom's receptacles, and we just don't know that. Um, but he certainly couldn't put the receptacles and the lighting together because that is a 14 tubes, and that wouldn't work. And he's going to be leaving outside of that bathroom to get the two bonus rooms, so that wouldn't work. So I'm going to assume with this 14 2 that he's only going to be picking up the lighting in the bathroom, and that's it. Okay? We'll assume that's what he's doing. Because we didn't see what he did, but maybe we will in future episodes. We'll see what he does up there. A little bit next to this piece there. I miss the basement king with me. Usually with me. He will be there for the next episode, part six. I promise. Okay. Everything. Well, we know all electricians can move. All right. So, <laughs> so there we go. So that's a great episode. Again, only a few issues with our electrician in this episode. I encourage you to go back and watch part one, part two, part three, and part four to kind of get you up to speed where we're at if you're new to this series. So check it out. Um, so far, I, you know, some of the things, again, he, he's made some statements, but again, it has not been too bad, nothing overly bad that we can't work through. And again, he works very efficient and he's, he is neat. I'm not, I'm, you know, got it, that neatness uh, does count for a lot. Um, even though neatness is an eye of the beholder, his work looks neat to me and we will pick him up in the next episode. So um, 
I should start doing some of the actual branch circuits that are out in the dwelling and we'll kind of see how he works it from there. But uh, we did get a little bit of a lesson on uh, tips and tricks and things in running. Uh, we, we, we learned securing and supporting and some of the rules that are associated with that. So you have a better understanding of 334.30. Uh, we even ventured into 314.17b2 when it came to the exception when dealing with two and a quarter by four inch boxes that have no clamp on them, securing that cable within eight inches. Um, he said four feet between securement points, but again, you can go up to four and a half feet, but four feet would be okay. Uh, just remember going over those top, uh, beams, uh, through the, um, uh, trusses that you will have to get up there and staple those. He hadn't done any stapling yet, except for the end there, but I think he will, um, because they still have to be secured. Uh, tips about driving staples, no need to drive it where it embeds the cable. In fact, you don't even need to drive it where it touches the cable. Just stop shy of the cable. You're perfectly fine. Uh, it's simply to hold it in place. Um, but other than that, all in all, I thought he, he did good so far. Nothing that I can get to uh, jump on him too bad about. Okay, and we can talk about his tennis shoes and his wasn't wearing protection, eye protection. But again, eh. You know, I was impressed with that M18, the Milwaukee uh, Hog. Don't tell the Grundberg. The basement king, don't tell him I said that because he loves Milwaukee products, you know? So anyway, that's it. So until next time, folks, thanks for joining me. Hope you got something out of this episode. Make sure you subscribe so that you can catch us on the next episode here of this special edition of Electrify Residential Wiring Commentary. Till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless. You've been listening to Electrify with your hosts, Paul Abernathy and Jay, the Basement King Grunberg.